So for those of you who haven't met me before, my name is Elizabeth Garrett. I use the pronoun she, her, and I prefer to be called Liz. So please feel free to, um, if you would like to email me, um, just put for the attention of Liz. I've been working on the Carers UK um, email advice line since around about the end of 2017. Although I've worked in advice and the general charity sector uh, for a lot longer than that. I also have experience of being a full-time carer, looking after both of my parents um, and trying to work full-time. So I have a little understanding about some of the problems that we face when we're in our caring roles. So what we're going to have a little look at today is DWP form filling. So there are a lot of different welfare benefit forms that you may come across. I'm going to just look at some general hints and tips that you might find useful and helpful. Some of it you might already know if you have some experience, um, but please do feel free to ask any questions. If I can't get the answer to you today, um, I will make sure that I get back in touch with you after today's session. And I'll give some contact details at the end just for how you can get in touch with the email advice line. Um, if you wanted to ask a question maybe after today's session, maybe something comes up and you think that, oh, I wish I'd asked that. So you're gonna be very welcome to get in touch with me at any point in the future as well. It's not just necessarily about forms filling about anything else. No, it's a community care inquiry. We've got colleagues on the advice line that can help us as well. So I've just had a, your system resource may affect your audio quality uh, warning come up. So if anyone is having any difficulties, please do either um, unmute your mic and let me know or just pop something in the chat box. Have a little, a little look to see what we can do. So benefit forms, you've probably come across them or you might be getting ready to, to complete one. So they can be complicated and they can be confusing. So getting an idea about the type of form, um, as soon as you can, don't put it off, will really help reduce the stress long term and could even help you get your claim processed more quickly. So a lot of benefits now can be claimed online. You don't have to claim them all online. You can ask for paper copies and there are some welfare benefits that can be claimed over the telephone. So depending on the benefit, it's going to depend on your type of application process. So I'm going to start with just some general, nice, gentle hints and tips about how to claim welfare benefits. If you have experience and you've got something that really worked, I would be so grateful if you would share it. There are so many different ways that we can claim welfare benefits, but actually if someone has lived experience, it's so helpful to other carers and myself. You know, I always like to learn new ways to do things as well. So let's get a little start here. So. The forms when they come, depending on the benefit, it could be 10 pages, it could be 40 pages. You might have to set aside an hour of your time, you know, if you're going to do it online. So take your time. Don't try and finish it all in one go. If it's an online application, press save as you go along, but make sure you know why you're saving it too. If you're going to be um, writing out the form, think about your hands, think about cramp, think about your handwriting. It doesn't all need to be done in one sitting. Sometimes you need to think about uh, what's going to be involved in the actual form itself. They're quite long um, and they need a lot of information. So I always say, read through the form, okay? So before you even put pen to paper, read through the form and make sure you've read through the guidance notes as well. So you've got an idea of what's needed and what to expect. Now, practically, if we're filling in a form, pen and paper, and we could be, I want you to think about the type of pen that you're going to be using. Now, a lot of the forms, when you read the small print, they say you need to use a black pen and you need to write in capital letters. I did a lot of form filling one year, and when I found I was filling out my Christmas cards and writing them all in block capitals, I knew that I was automatically just going into default form filling mode. So think about your pen. Um, black generally is the preferred one. It doesn't necessarily need to be block capitals, but it does need to be legible. Now, if you make a mistake, and we can all make mistakes, so don't worry, just cross it out, okay? Don't use Tipex, don't use correcting fluid, just cross it out and write alongside. So when we're completing the form, we need to give as much information as we can, okay? So we need to state the obvious. So even if it seems normal or it's just part of someone's daily life, 
or you're using aids and adaptations to help and support you, depending on the claim that you're making, include all of it. Give information about the condition as well, because absolutely everything helps and the person who potentially is making the decision about the claim might not be a medical expert. So they might not know about a particular condition. And let's not forget that a lot of conditions that people believe they have a good understanding of, such as arthritis, how arthritis affects each person is completely individual to them. So you really need, when we're filling out these forms, to state the obvious, give as much information as you can, and consider and think about any aids or adaptations that have been um, made for that person you're providing care and support for, or even yourself. So in order to do this, now you can write outside the boxes. You don't need to try and fit everything into the little tiny boxes. I've got quite big handwriting, so I used to find it quite difficult to fit a lot of information in there. So rather than try and miss something out, um, there are normally extra boxes towards the end of the form that you can fill in. It's normally something like, do you have any extra information that you would like to tell us about? Or please use space to um, add in any extra information you think would be helpful for us. So if you're doing a paper form, just when you go to the extra box, um, you need to cross-reference it a little bit. So if we're doing question seven, for example, lists of medications used. So what you could do at question seven is you could either attach a prescription list and put a question seven, um, say attach prescription list. And so you could staple it onto the page or you could make sure that it's included. Um, if you fill up the list, or you fill up that particular box for question seven and you go to the extra information box, just put at the top extra information for question seven and then include it. Now, if you fill all of the extra boxes, which we could do, just add in some extra A4 paper, but make sure you put the name and the national insurance number if, that's, if it's relevant to the claim, but always the name um, so it doesn't get lost. And if you feel the need to staple it in, staple it in. OK, just to make sure that nothing gets lost. OK, so we can add in this extra information. Now, we also need to think about. Oh, there we go. I didn't click the button. Um, sometimes it can be completely overwhelming and that's understandable. As carers, you've got a lot on your plate. Um, you've got your family life, you've got your caring life, you may have work, you know, you've got your life as well to consider. And some of these forms can be really complex and complicated, especially the first time you're filling them in. So you might want to um, seek advice from a welfare benefits advisor or someone who is familiar with completing the form, maybe from your local authority. Um, it could be from, uh, I don't know, a charity such as Macmillan HUK, Citizens Advice, for example. Um, so if you feel having looked through the form and starting to give it consideration that actually you would rather someone helped and supported you with that, I've included some resources at the end of this presentation, including how to find someone local to you. So, you know, you can have a look to see if there's anybody that can help you complete the form, um, because not all of us want to spend the time to do that. OK, so. When we are thinking about completing the form, not only is it important to be familiar with what's being asked and the reasons why it's being asked, so the eligibility criteria, but we also need to think practically here. So with all the disability um, forms, for example, so attendance allowance, personal independence payment, um, what's the other one, disability living allowance, and then the work capability forms, so such as the ones for universal credit or maybe employment and support allowance. What matters is what help and support you need and how these conditions impact on somebody's life, not whether they are actually getting help and support. So a really important thing is just to think about how does this condition impact on that person's ability in relation to the eligibility criteria for the benefit. If you don't know what you're trying to prove, it's really difficult to prove it. So if you're not sure how much help somebody um, actually needs, it's a really good idea um, to keep a diary. A diary can also help you um, see how long things actually take. 
So it might be that you think, oh, you know, if I'm just helping my mum get get ready on the end of an evening, you know, so we 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 do the tablets, we get the drinks, um, we wash, um, we maybe get our pajamas on, we know we get settled in bed, and then you run downstairs and you get the oh, you've forgotten the water, so you take some water up and then maybe um provide them with a book or make sure they've got the telly remote, make sure that they've got the, the way of contacting you in case anything happens. You might, oh, that only takes 10 minutes. If you actually sit down and do a diary, uh, it could take 30 minutes, it could take 45 minutes. You know, keep a diary for a week and it's a really good idea of just giving them an idea of what help and support that person needs um, and how often they need it. It doesn't need to be anything flash. It could be a notebook if you've got one. It could be the back of an envelope. It could be a piece of A4 paper. And depending on the benefit you're claiming, so for example, if you are claiming disability living allowance for a child, there's a diary sheet included in the guidance notes. The Citizens Advice website has a blank diary template if you wanted to just get some prompts about some of the things that um, you could be doing. So always just think about the amount and type of care and support needed, not only just through the day, but also at night. And it's really useful when you complete a diary, um, but actually you've got evidence um, when you help fill out a form. Um, one of the most powerful disability living allowance claims that I did was for um, somebody who, um, whose little boy didn't have a diagnosis at the time, but she was so, at the end of a tether, there was no other way about, you know, the extra supervision and the damage that the child was doing, that she, she wrote a diary, um, mum wrote a diary from her perspective about how um, they'd had to call a fire brigade out, how she'd ended up um, locking the child in the bedroom while she sat outside and cried, while she called for a partner to come and help her. And she was so worried that this diary wouldn't actually show her in a good light. But what it actually demonstrated was, you know, the supervision that was needed um, for that person. And so that can be easily translated to other welfare benefits as well. And we always need to have this evidence. Evidence is really important. So it could be from a healthcare professional, um, it could be for a friend, a family member, um, it could be that you write some evidence, you write a statement yourself in the role of the carer. Um, about the help and support that you give to that person or an occupational therapist or a consultant's letter. Um, it doesn't necessarily need to be something that you pay for. Now, I've just seen in the chat box, and so Laura, I have seen your question. So what I will do is I'll come back to that at the end. Um, so just that, you know, there is a backlog with evidence and sometimes you, you, you are charged for it. So there are some things that you can do to get around it. Um, but I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit at the end. Okay, so with any evidence that you get, okay, it's really important that you keep a copy of it. Don't send the only copy of what you have off. And also keep a copy of your form. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about how you can do this um, in quite a simple way, just in case. And I'm not at all cynical here that forms don't always get delivered or it, things get lost on people's desks. But just in case, I'm very much a just in case kind of girl. So keep a copy of the form and any evidence that you send, just in case. Okay, so what else do we need to think about? Now, one of the big things that um, I know from experience of providing care and support, but also from the work that I've done, is that not all medical conditions are the same every day. Okay, some days people need more help, some days they need less help. And so these are what's known in the trade as fluctuating conditions. Okay, just to confuse you, we do like a bit of jargon when it comes to filling out forms. So with a fluctuating condition, okay, if you are describing a fluctuating condition, it's very easy to fall into, oh, we've got bad days um, and we've got good days. So really, what we should start to think about is if we use the term bad day and better days to describe any changes in someone's condition. If you use terms like a good day or a normal day, that can imply that the person you care for has no extra need for help and support on those days. And what we're looking at with a lot of the benefit claims is how many times does that person need care and support? How often do they need that care and support? 
So if you're saying that you have two bad days a week, but actually you have five good days a week, you know, on the process of, wow, I'm I can't even think what I'm trying to say here. On the grand scheme of things, you actually have bad days for less time than you have good days. So you don't actually need that much help and support. So they're, they're looking very much at the descriptions of how people, um, conditions affect them on a day-to-day -day term. So think about bad days and better days because people do have better days, but very rarely do they ever have a really, really great day where they haven't had to take any medication, they haven't been affected by the health condition, they haven't needed any help and support from you. They've been able to do everything that they would normally have done before that they were impacted by their long-term disability or health condition. So better days and bad days, okay? Because that shows that there's an underlying reason why someone is applying for this benefit. Now on some of the benefit forms, you may have come across this box. And you might think, oh, yes, this is going to make my life so much easier. So, for example, um, you might have a question and then you've got three little boxes. You've got yes, no, it varies. OK, so if you click it varies, you're automatically trying to suggest that the activity can be done some of the time. Okay? It varies. OK, so then we're back to um, bad days and better days. So if somebody does need help with something, it's better to say that no, they cannot do it and then put in the box because within each question, there's always a comments box and then put in that, you know, my mum could not put her slippers on every day, especially on days when she was having the flare up. There may have been a better day where she might have been able to do it by herself. OK, so rather than put it varies, always put a yes or no answer where you can unless you genuinely are working with a condition where it varies but even if you tick it varies still put that there are better days and there are good days you sorry there are better days and there are bad days you know so just making it really clear that actually it's more normal than not for help and support to be needed and on that note it's really important, don't play down any health conditions or disabilities. Include the description of needs on the bad days as well as the better days. So the decision maker has a really clear insight into the full extent of the care and support and supervision that's needed. So you factor in things like pain, fatigue, motivation. If somebody does something, so if I do something today, is that going to wipe me out tomorrow? You know, are they going to need extra help and support? Yes, they've managed to get to the ice cream parlor and have an ice cream today, but tomorrow they're not going to be able to get out of bed. You know, so make sure that you mention pain, fatigue and motivation. Don't say that something can be done if it cannot be done safely, repeatedly and in a reasonable time and to the same standard as anybody else. Don't say that I can get dressed, you know, I can get the clothes from the bottom of the bed, you know, I can get my underwear on, I can get my top on, I can get my trousers on, I can pull my socks on. If it's not safe, you know, if you've got an adaption or a different way, you've, you've changed all your clothes to Velcro or over the head, um, it takes you 25 minutes to get dressed because you have to sit down or you've got to prop yourself up or you've got to use one of the aids and adaptations that have been provided for you. Uh, you get out of breath, it causes you pain, lightheadedness, for example. So yes, I got dressed, but it took 25 minutes to do that. You know, so don't say that, oh, I can get dressed, I don't need any help and support. If the only reasons you can get dressed is because you've adapted your life to such a point, then actually you've got grab whales at the bottom of the bed. Um, Liz comes along and puts your clothes there so you know what it is you're going to wear. You wear um, over the head and uh, tops and pull up skirts or trousers. You don't wear tights anymore. You've got Velcro adapted slippers, um, for example. So just think about what aids and adaptations you have put in place to be able to live an independent life for the person that you're supporting or how much help and support is actually needed and how long these things take. It's really easy to underestimate how often um, things take. 
and also how often is this help needed okay rather than how often do they actually get help so it could be that somebody actually needs help to get in and out of the chair uh, they can struggle and do it themselves so they've got a what's it a riser recliner chair i think it is you know they can push a button and they can get up and maybe two or three times they can do that themselves you know if they're going to go to the loo or um answer the door depending on that person that you're working with um but sometimes they just can't do it you know so it is what it is they did it once they can't do it twice so you know even if that person can do it sometimes independently how often do they need that help and support and dare i say it the bathroom the bathroom is one where people just really don't want to say that they need help or support the toilet for example you might find that if you're filling out a disability form that the person that you're helping and supporting is, is very happy to talk about any help and support they may need getting in and out of the chair. And that's why they've got a riser recliner, for example, or they've got a handrest, or they may be leaning on a piece of furniture. But they have no problem at all getting on and off the toilet. The decision maker could potentially look at that and go, they need help getting out of the chair? don't need help getting off the toilet you know so there's inconsistencies there so it's difficult but sometimes you've got to really give um, examples about how often they get help and um, how often they need that help not always if you only help them once a day um, but actually they need that help a lot more for example so give lots of examples especially for things that are difficult or not safe Okay, so bring in those examples. And I have got some examples that I'm, I'm just gonna go, go through here to give you a little bit of an idea about what we can look at. So with all welfare benefits, with all of them, it's up to you, the claimant, to prove you're eligible by telling the Department of Work and Pensions how you meet the eligibility criteria, which is so important that we find out what that eligibility criteria it is. What jargon are they using? Um, and if it's not something you're comfortable with, read the guidance notes or feel happy to drop me an email or get some help from a local welfare benefits advisor. Now, with a diagnosis, and this is what's so good about a lot of the welfare benefits, is that there's no general guarantee of eligibility based on specific diagnosis. So it's all about meeting the criteria for that particular benefit. So what I thought I would do is I would use the disability benefit. Now this one's called personal independence payment. It's known as PIP um, and it's for people who are over 16 but under state retirement age at the time of claiming. Okay, it's made of two components. It's got a daily living component and it's got a mobility component. For the daily living component, you need to show how your condition affects everyday activities, so such as washing, dressing, bathing, making food, um, taking food. And for the mobility component, it's about how you get around or if you can plan a journey safely, for example. So for each of these activities, there's a list and it's called a descriptive. And you're avoid, avoided, you're awarded points based on the descriptor that most closely matches the circumstances of the person who's making the claim. So there are lots of different categories or different activity descriptors. So we've got things like preparing food, washing and bathing, dressing and undressing, communicating, um, making decisions about money, engaging with people, moving around. So I've as we go through these slides, and you will get a copy of them, I've included some links to different things for you to have a look at. So these, this is a full list of the activities and descriptors for personal independence payment. Okay, so depending on the descriptor, um, you need to think about how often does that person need help? Um, do they need help most of the time? Can they do it safely? And how long does it take someone to do something, for example? Or do they need an aid or adaptation to be able to do something? 
So depending on the number of points you're awarded for responses to questions, this is for PIP, for example, you'll either receive a standard rate or you'll receive an enhanced rate, a total of eight points for the standard payment and 12 points for the enhanced payment. So we've got a point-based system here that we're trying to show that um, eligibility is met. So on the PIP form, there's um, a daily living activity and it's all about preparing food. So I'm gonna use preparing food as an example. So the first thing that we do is we read the guidance notes, we familiarize ourselves with the descriptors, the jargon and what is actually meant. So for example, preparing food. So this activity, it's not a reflection of someone's cooking skills but instead it looks at the impact of the health condition or long-term disability that somebody has on their ability to be able to carry out the task of preparing and cooking a simple meal. So there's a lot of things we might not know. So what they were setting here is someone's ability to open packaging, serve food, peel and chop food, use a microwave, an oven, a cooker or a hob to cook or heat food. And a simple meal is described as a cooked one course meal for one person made from fresh ingredients. OK, but you wouldn't know any of that if you hadn't read the guidance notes. OK, so let's have a little look at what this means. So based on the descriptors, so these are the points for that particular activity. If you can safely prepare and cook a simple meal without help most of the time, whenever you need to, and it's done in a reasonable length of time, you will score no points. If you cannot prepare and cook food, you will get a score of eight points, okay? So there are different categories in between where the scoring is. So if you need to use an aid or appliance to be able to prepare or cook a simple meal, you will be awarded two points. If you needed supervision or assistance to either prepare or cook a simple meal, you will be awarded four points. So as you can see, there are different points that are associated with each category. And this is what we need to prove when we're completing the form. We need to show how somebody's long-term health condition or disability impacts them and their ability for this particular activity about preparing food. Now, it could be that actually the person doesn't need any help to prepare and cook food, but they need help and support in other areas. Just because you don't need any help in a particular activity, it doesn't mean that it's not worth putting in a claim. It just means that for this one, um, you're not going to be eligible to score any points. And remember, we're trying to get eight points for a standard award and 12 points for um, an enhanced award over all of the different activities. OK, so what does this actually mean in practice? So the SCOPE website has got some really clear examples, which I thought I would show you, and I've included some links. So when you're filling in the form, um, always include the descriptor, so the question that you're answering, um, and the word because in your answer, okay? So try to give examples of difficulties or accidents that have potentially been had when attempting that activity, or when that person's needed help or used an aid or adaptation. So let's have a look at descriptor B. So descriptor B was all about using an aid or appliance to prepare or cook a simple meal. So that was the descriptor. So an answer for that could be, I need to use an aid or appliance to prepare or cook a simple meal. So just repeat back the descriptor most of the time because I am unable to stand without support. So I cannot wash vegetables at the sink or carry a hot pan from the stove to the table. I can drop plates of food, which means I have to start again. If I'm too tired to do that, I do not eat. So that shows what happens if they do not have an aid or appliance to prepare or cook a simple meal with them, okay? So can't wash vegetables, can't carry hot pans, for example, can drop plates of food, and what the outcome potentially could be. I've got a couple more that we'll just have a little look at. So <clears throat> let's have a little look. Descriptor C is about cooking a simple meal using um, a conventional cooker. Um, and it talks a little bit about microwaves, for example. So you would put, I cannot cook a simple meal using a conventional cooker. 
and I cannot use the microwave most of the time because I'm unable to grip and pull open the door of the microwave. So I rarely eat a hot meal. So it just gives you, um, you have to give the reason why and potentially what the outcome is of you not being able to do something. Once you get into the mindset and you start to think about that very important word, because, and what happens. So to script a day was all about pre prompting to prepare. And for some people, they just forget to eat. Um, so I need prompting to prepare or cook a simple meal. That's a descriptor most of the time, because my condition means I forget I need to eat or I do not remember things if no one is there to remind me or prompt me. If no one reminds me or prompts me, for example, I do not eat. Um, I once caught a tea towel on fire because I forgot the gas ring was on and put the towel on it, for example. Or it could be um, I once forgot to, um, to take my medication because I normally take it when I eat. I forgot to eat and as a result, my medication meant that my blood sugars or whatever kind of medication it is, you know, was impacted. So as you can see, we're already back to that very first slide where a lot of thought has to go into it. And these forms take a lot of time to complete. You don't need to do it all in one go. Um, and this last one, descriptor F, was all about, I cannot prepare and cook food because my condition makes it impossible. So if someone does not prepare food for me, I do not eat. I once went 24 hours without eating. Because my carer had to go to hospital for an emergency and was unable to tell anyone I was at home. So a lot of you, if you've come on my sessions before, uh, especially some of the, if you're new to caring, I always just go on about the importance of registering as a carer somewhere and also having an emergency plan. Uh, just in case this particular situation does happen, you know, the emergency plan, making sure you're registered as a carer on somebody's healthcare records um, and on your own healthcare records as well. So somebody knows um, that that person that you're providing care and support for is potentially home alone and isn't going to be taking the medication or isn't going to be eating. Okay, so it's, it's quite straightforward. Once you get the hang of it and you think about your language and you think about what you're trying to show is how you meet that particular descriptor. Now, there is a little sting in the tail here. So you can only score one set of points from each activity. So if two or more apply from the same activity, only the highest point will score. So you might find that actually all of those descriptors apply to the person that you're providing care and support to. But rather than be awarded two points and four points and six points and eight points, which will take you straight over the eight points, um, you are only awarded the highest point from that activity, which is then added to the points from another activity. So what does that actually mean? So descriptor B was all about needs to use an aid or appliance to be able to prepare or cook a simple meal. So that was awarded two points. But descriptor E needs supervision or assistance to either prepare or cook a simple meal, would award someone four points. You can't get both lots of points. So in this particular case, although both descriptors apply, you'll only receive four points because that's the highest one. And that would be for the needs, supervision or assistance to prepare a cook or simple meal. And then that's added on to the points from other activities. So it could be dressing and undressing, um, managing money, for example, um, needing help and support to communicate effectively with this particular benefit. So you might find that actually you can score quite low in each of the categories because they need a little bit of help and support. So they might get four lots of two points and that's, that's perfectly fine. That's going to score eight points. OK, so rather than going for a big activity point, look, look at the little ones, the little ones, they always say that, don't they? The little ones all add up and they do. They do. They really, really do. OK, so in summary. Oh, I think you already know what I'm going to say here, don't you? Set aside plenty of time to complete the application. OK, make sure you read through the whole application and any notes. If you've got a trusted friend, 
um, or the person that you're providing care and support for is happy to do it, get a second pair of eyes on it, especially if you're doing it yourself. What's really important, and I see a lot of it, is that the same information actually applies to more than one descriptor. So I talked a little bit about getting in and out of the chair and getting on and off the toilet, for example. If that person needs help and support to get in and out of a chair, on and off the toilet and in and out of bed for the same reasons and you find yourself repeating it over and over and over, don't be afraid to repeat that information over and over and over, especially if it relates to different sections of the form. Don't rely on a decision maker to tie up different sections together. A lot of them will, but don't rely on it. So it could be that actually, if it is exactly the same, you could put for question nine, um, the person needs help and support doing this because, um, and then you could put C explanation in uh, extra information or C explanation from activity number four. You, know, you can cross reference it, um, but actually, if you're able to, it's better just to include it, even though you might think, oh, I'm just repeating myself. Repeat yourself as many times as you need to. It's better to provide too much information than not enough information. Make sure that you double check all your documents and information that you're going to be sending, that you need to complete that application um, and make sure that they are all named. So they've all got the person's name on um, and if relevant, the national insurance number as well. And if you're sending in more than one, you might want to number them and maybe reference them. So you could put a reference sheet on there for them. Um, submit your applications as soon as you can, um, depending on which ones that you're doing. Sometimes you might have a four week return. It might be a six week return. It could be a renewal. So it might be four or five months ahead that you get it. Um, if you need extra time um, because you haven't completed the form yet, um, you ring the Department of Work and Pensions or ring the relevant um, department. They may extend it. There's no guarantee, but they may extend the return date. What I would say is don't hold off sending a completed form because you're waiting for some supporting evidence to come in. Send the form, put at the back of it, further evidence to be or further um, information to be provided. And then when you send in the further information, make sure you put the name, national insurance number and the benefit claim on the extra information when you're sending it in. So it'll all be tied up together by the Department of Work and Pensions. Don't be afraid to seek help and support. So you can have a good look at Advice Local. Um, with Advice Local, it's a website you pop in, um, your postcode and you pop in what kind of support you would need. So in this particular case, from the drop down menu, you would select welfare benefits. And then it'll come up with organisations who are near to you that potentially will be able to help you. And this is a really important one and something that we forget to do. OK, reward yourself. So filling in these forms can be really time consuming and it can be really stressful. As the focus of the form filling is very much on what can't be done or what help and support does somebody need or how often do they need that help and support. So that can be quite demoralizing. So take a little bit of time, you know, just to reward yourself. Take a little bit of me time. Um, think about, you know, the things that you've achieved there. Um, and even if you haven't completed the form yourself and you've had the support of a welfare benefits person, Still take that time to reward yourself because you've gathered that information um, and it is just as time consuming and stressful. So, you know, don't just think, oh, phew, that's done. You know, take a little bit of time just to, to give yourself a little reward for that, whatever it is that makes, makes things happier for you. So these are some further resources. Now, there are lots of different forms, so there's no way that I could cover all of the different forms. And a lot of other organisations, including us here at Carers UK, have got different things on our website. So if you are completing a disability living allowance for a form, for example, contact who are a charity that support families. Um, I've got some really good videos and step-by-step -step instructions for disability living allowance forms. Citizens Advice have got some really good stuff about completing a PIP independence payment form as to scope, which I've just gone through some of it. Uh, attendance allowance forms from Citizens Advice, Carers UK, 
we've got some really good information about claiming care allowance for the first time. It's been written by carers, so I've just included links to that. If you're claiming universal credit, again, Citizens Advice have got some good stuff. And again, just to find a local advisor to you. But what you might also find, and it isn't something that I've copied, but it's just worth thinking about. If you're making a claim for a disability benefit, because somebody's got arthritis, for example, um, the, oh, it's called Arthritis UK. Um, they've got some really good sort of bespoke information about how you can claim a disability benefit based on a health condition. So if someone's got dementia, for example, the Alzheimer's Society um, has got some good information on there. Diabetes, Diabetes UK has got some. You know, there are lots of different ways that you can find out information to support and help you. So just on that note, I'm just going to go over to, to any questions. Um, at the end slide, the, what I do have is just about if you want to contact um, um, the email advice line where I work with my colleagues, we provide email advice, funnily enough, um, and it's advice at carersuk.org. Uh, if you want to ask me in particular, you can just put for attention of Liz on it. But if not, one of my colleagues, they'll be very happy to pick it up.